Hello everyone, I'm Jason Cohen, the author of an introduction to the art and science of Chinese tea ceremony. Today we're discussing Book 1, Chapter 7, Historical Scholastic Disinterest. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny and Ryan Ott. Hello, Pat. Hey, Jason. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Afternoon. My first question, could you summarize for our listeners why there are no schools of Chinese tea ceremony? So to both briefly summarize the chapter, as well as, uh, you know, summarize your perspectives on why uh, there was no formalized school of Chinese tea ceremony developed, you know, first, and I would say foremost, uh, progression was more important than tradition uh, for Chinese tea ceremony. So as, uh, you know, new teas, new tools, wares, et cetera, techniques developed, it was more important within the process for it to progress uh, than I think to track and try and constrain that progression uh, through formalized tradition. Uh, I think the uh, other point that you had made uh, in the article, in which I definitely agree with, many of the literati, elites, etc., who were practicing this praxis historically were made men. Uh, they had gone through their whole life studying as high-level scholars who probably took uh, imperial examinations or other forms of testing, and they just probably would not want to take, right, another formalized test after going through a life of, short, short as it might have been, right, 20 years, 30 years of study, they probably were not going to submit themselves to more testing. And so it was more of a casual pursuit or a hobby for cultivation. And then I would say the third reason, which you had listed, was, you know, there was some development of tea ceremonies within the monasteries in the Tang Dynasty. And you very specifically cited, right, the Great Suppression of Buddhism by Emperor Wu Zheng, who was a very... Taoist emperor. And so, you know, the flourishing of tea ceremony that might have happened at that time uh, was really put on hold and never really recovered with the same pace that it had been going with before the Great Suppression. So uh, for those three reasons that you had listed, you know, historically, there was no development of a uh, school, a formalized school of Chinese tea ceremony. Um, but I think, you know, the the power of those three reasons kind of moves forward through the present day. You, you use the term uh, made man. Uh, I suspect you don't mean in the mafiosa Borsellino effect of made man. What, what, what did you mean by that? So men, men of means, I think, is what you literally said. Uh, so no, there's no, uh, you know, Gambino, Tang Dynasty crime family to my knowledge, although I'm sure there is some, some other interesting Tang Dynasty syndicates that we could research. But uh, no, I mean, um, these are, you know, the scholars, the literati, so basically members of a caste in some ways without the religious connotations where um, they were born into wealth or status. They also continued to study, right, so that they could achieve either a governmental post or some other profession or role that would uh, bestow upon them not only status, but potentially land, money. Uh, so these were people who didn't have to worry about where their food was coming from, right, and had lots of leisure time to uh, study and cultivate themselves. And do we see any collarlies anywhere else in the world of such men of means uh, attempting to create a, a, a praxis or an art form or uh, a society where they refuse to submit themselves to formal top-down institutions? You know, I, I really like where that question was going. I, I honestly do not have an answer. Did you have something in mind when you asked that question, Jason? The, the reference within the chapter is to uh, the Society of Letters, um, the individuals in the height of the Age of Enlightenment um, who formed uh, academic societies or who formed um, the academies or uh, some of the scientific societies like Royal Asiatic Society or others uh, in order to study and collect information. But in order to be part of that society, you already had to be an educated individual. You weren't going to submit yourself to a, a university system, right, and become a student again. And it's, it's an interesting uh, comparison, I think, so much because the Society of Letters is very much a Western thing. Uh, it was enabled by um, reliable long-term posts. People would trade information and trade knowledge uh, about details, about things that they were thinking of. And it was the beginning uh, of the formation for, for Enlightenment principles. Um, and I wonder if we could find any any likewise comparisons, the, the literati who were, to some extent, um, uh, endorsed certain enlightenment principles like Gawu, right? The investigation of things actually went and traveled to the tea fields and traveled 
to the monasteries where the tea was produced um, and did not submit themselves to, to any type of, uh, you know, um, hierarchical relationship with an institution. Uh, and yet this practice was still able to progress, right? The, the Society of Letters had individuals who are more famous or more respected or more followed than others. You know, what was there not the same uh, cultural effects um, amongst uh, literati practitioners um, for, for tea and other arts? Which brings me to my next question. Uh, I argue in a previous chapter, the progression requires top-down or bottom-up forces. Which of those forces shaped the practice of the Chinese literati? I believe that it's the bottom, uh, more of a bottoms up force, uh, progressing things along than a top down due to the lack of a formal institution for Chinese tea ceremony. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think, right, uh, particularly Jason, you call out, I think in your second reason uh, listed within the chapter, right, that uh, it's it's a personal pursuit. It's about um, you know rapidly changing techniques, developing them uh, between practitioners, sharing wares, ideas, etc. Um, so I think really what we've seen was was completely bottoms up, and uh, that that goes to show why we at this point still in history don't have a formalized institution around Chinese tea ceremony because it's always been driven uh, bottoms up. And. Why is that so much the case, not just in Chinese tea, but across other Chinese art forms, right? We, we see this literati disinterest in scholastic practice across uh, calligraphy, we see it across um, poetry, we see it across um, uh, landscape painting. Although landscape painting, there was much more of a student master relationship in. Um, you know, anything that, that veered into the, the ideal practices of a scholar in a study alone tended to be um, a singular personal pursuits that there were no schools from. And to, to kind of contrast how weird that was, right? In, in Europe, you had all of the famous painters who ran schools. You, you, there, Leonardo da Vinci had students um, uh, Raphael had students, Michelangelo had students, um, and sometimes we find works that uh, are not copies, but that are attempts of reproducing the works of the great masters, right? There's a Mona Lisa printed by uh, one, of, one of Da Vinci's students. Um, and in Japan, you see the same thing. Every, in, you don't only see the same thing, but you actually see competing schools, right? Very regimented, top-down competing schools. So, different schools of Ikebana, different schools of calligraphy, different schools of poetry. Um, and you are expected to conform to the rules of the school and to produce works that were geared to the preferences of the school and people who have been taught in the school. Um, but we don't see that at all in, in Chinese literati culture. And, and so the question is why? One of the interesting things about tea is that the art form itself is so experiential in nature. So it's not producing the same physical body of work um, that can be cross-referenced. It's very fleeting uh, because it's experiential. So unlike calligraphy or, or landscape painting, right, where there's, you can create a body of work um, with something as ephemeral as, as Chinese tea ceremony, you can't do that. So I think it makes it much harder without top-down forces. So I think one of the reasons that we see it in Japan um, is because it got a lot of top-down support. And it was, you know, there was a lot of incentives to, to participate. It's tied to holidays like Robiraki and Hatsugama and social events um, and ways to show off your, your cultural and economic capital. Um, you know, there's no such seasonal holidays in Chinese tea ceremony in, in any way. It does, it's not linked to those types of events. And also the big push of the, the Japanese government, which, which Pat can speak to more, you know, a huge part of nation building that Japan did was this top-down um, promotion of the tea arts. In the Meiji uh, and moving forward as, as Japan became more open uh, and started to try and share their culture with the world, um, became a more industrialized nation. Um, you definitely do see 
um, you know, tea ceremony being used as a nation building tool. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of old pamphlets, letters, et cetera, from world fairs where tea ceremony was showed off as a part of Japanese culture uh, to showcase things like omotenashi, right, uh, hospitality. So it was, it was definitely institutionalized in a way, you know, not, not only by schools, but the government utilized it as well um, to try and spread not just Japanese tea ceremony, but culture. I, I think not only um, the, what you had talked about, Ryan, where we see in other, you know, tea cultures, this institutionalization, um, I, I think for me, particularly uh, speaking to the question you had asked, Jason, when I think about it, it really comes back to this being a very personal pursuit uh, of cultivation. And so I think a lot of, you know, these, these scholars, literati, et cetera, um, it really tied into their own personal cultivation. And so I think there maybe was a form of, I don't want to say specifically individualism, right? But um, an exploration of the self um, that they didn't want to be confined by specific rules within a specific school. Because uh, as you had mentioned, and we talked about already, right, they've already gone through very rigorous schooling um, and, you know, passed very rigorous exams. I, I think about, you know, uh, myself, and you guys can probably speak to this too, right? But we've already gone through many, many years of school, right? Uh, we're, we're working professionals. Uh, when it comes to tea, my learning in tea is, is intensely personal. And while, I, of course, I enjoy sharing it with everyone, uh, you know, and, and interacting in a community, um, at the same time when I'm learning about tea and when I'm really doing uh, my own experiments, right, different brewing techniques, exploring different teas, um, there's something really intensely personal about that cultivation where I felt it very useful to learn in the form of a lineage, right, or more of a school in the beginning. Um, but once I had developed my bearings, it, it definitely became much more enjoyable to pursue tea as a very personal pursuit of cultivation. And I like to assume that maybe these scholars of the past felt the same, uh, but that might just be aligning myself right with their, their cultural capital, as it were. Well, I thought for sure you were going to take the Specialty Tea Association's Tea Master Blenders exam. Uh, it was offered to me for free, actually, but um, I did not take it. I probably will at some point. So, that, so Ryan, do you feel the same way? Um, do you feel that your tea practice is intensely personal? And if so, why do you continuously post on Instagram? Well, well he doesn't. He's not good at it. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't post that frequently. It's all relative, just in comparison. No, I mean, yeah, I think, zero versus uh, four times a year. <laughs> I think that um, it is a personal practice because it's, a, it's mostly about cultivating your own skill uh, or others' skills. So, you know, Penn State is a lot more focused on other people and, and sharing knowledge. But now that we don't have that institution or that centralized location, it morphs itself much into a, a more personal pursuit. I, I would much rather have this practice be, have the majority of my practice be associated with some form of institution um, rather than as a, a, you know, a practicing tea hermit. And is the current lack of schools in the West, this is something we've spoken about before, is this another historical antecedent that we've just inherited from the Chinese tradition, um, from, the, from the culture that we're a part of? Or is this other external forces that prevent scholastic development within Chinese tea ceremony? I think this is definitely uh, the latter. I think it's other external forces because uh, there are Chinese tea schools, or at the very least tea schools in the US. Uh, I think the, the Western perspective uh, definitely sees this art, takes it, and tries to form a scholastic framework around it. As I think, you know, you alluded to, we've talked before about, you know, why haven't some of those institutions picked up? Why hasn't one become the dominance, right, in the U.S.? Why doesn't everyone follow one curriculum? Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I don't think uh, in the West, the reason that we don't have a, a single institution, et cetera, is because of what we've inherited. Because I think within our culture, right, within the U.S., um, we don't really think very much about the inherited culture. We kind of just do whatever feels right or whatever I think works within a capitalist system. Uh, so I, I think you will see schools of tea ceremony continue to pop up within the West. But uh, as we've mentioned, I'm, I'm not sure that anyone will rise to the top. Also depends on intrinsic motivation and, you know, what, what's the means to the end, right? For some people, it's to enhance their spiritual practice. Um, for some people, it's because they want to get a job or work in industry. 
you know, much more similar to what the SCA is for coffee. In terms of a more intellectual, historical driven praxis that, that we are interested in, you know, it doesn't seem like uh, there's a whole lot of, there's a smaller pool of interest. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people really want to talk about, uh, you know, very specifically, right, the effects of uh, different historical events on the practice of Chinese tea ceremony, uh, you know, the institutionalization, top down drivers, bottoms up, right? Uh, we, we know that that's definitely a much smaller pool of people. But, you know, it's, it's always great to find the people who are, are your community, right? So we hope to keep finding more. I, I thought this was going to be a weekly special coming soon to HBO Max. Tune in next yeah, week. Yeah, we're not getting picked up by Spotify as an exclusive. <laughs> to tune in next week to find out on the next adventure of Lu Yu. Yeah, no, it's going to be, you know, the uh, Call Her Daddy, the Joe Rogan experience, and then Tea Technique, right? Like Spotify <laughs> exclusive podcasts. We're just waiting for our $100 million deal to come in. That'll help fund a lot of the uh, Ming teapot. <laughs> yeah, for the uh, for the <laughs> Ming, Ming Shipwreck Club. I, I think at that point, we'll just have a, uh, you know, the Jason Cohen uh, Tea Institute of the Americas. <laughs> $100 million, you can make a lot happen. Yeah, but I don't think anyone's interested enough in... Uh, in uh... You'll have 10 members, 20 members. They'll have access to some really nice teapots. That is all I need. In uh, On a more serious note, this topic you know, is, is um, agreeably uh, quite esoteric, right? This is not the type of um, discourse that is usually looked for or sought after. People say, oh, wow, I had this great experience in tea. I want to learn more about Chinese tea. And it's not, I wonder why there weren't any top-down driven schools of Chinese tea ceremony uh, stemming out of the dynastic period in comparison to any of the Japanese or uh, European cultural institutions that continue to progress various praxis of other traditions around the world. What could be the historical antecedents that predicated the lack uh, of these institutions and turn to tea technique and say to themselves, of course, uh, this was like the society of Eureka. Plenty. Eureka, right. So this is, this is admittedly uh, very esoteric. It is admittedly um, almost not, no, I don't want to say a sideshow, but this is almost uh, feels tangential. And yet we've actually already discussed part of this, right? We discussed this in schools, tests, and competitions. And now we've come back here for this re-examination. Why is this re-examination necessary in the course of the book? Now that the book is so far along or that we're so far along in the book, it's easier. It, it, it's a nice point to look backwards and explain and come up with attribution for, for why we are where we are. Um, there's more frameworks, top down, bottom up, various forms of capital, um, various layers and constructs or scaffolding that we can use as a foundation to re-examine um, how we got where we are. I think um, particularly in chapter four, right, when we looked at top down, bottom up, schools tests, um, we really, although we made it, might have dug back a little bit in time, it was really looking at our contemporary milieu, uh, particularly, I would say, after going through the past two chapters, right? Uh, so the Bordodian analysis and wealth and knowledge, there has been a bigger focus on history, particularly uh, the impacts of Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism on tea ceremony, how it's kind of helped shape some of the philosophies and mindset of the practitioners who approach the praxis. I think from there, it makes sense to build upon that and show during those times, right, dynastic China, now that we know so much more about the individuals who were practicing this praxis, uh, we can understand more about why there was no top-down driver or institutionalized uh, school built up around the praxis, because we know so much more about them after reading the past couple chapters. Uh, and that, that's information, right, we didn't have in chapter four. I think it just helped to outline. It, it just gave us little hints looking forward into the future um, that could stay with us as we move through the chapters and think about uh, was, was, you know, this aesthetic push by, you know, uh, emperors, uh, like Qing emperors, right? Was this top down? Was this bottoms up? It gave us tools as we move through the chapters. And now we're looking back after having learned what we learned. Uh, and I think it is a really good point to, uh, to stop and still reflect on why isn't there a formalized school of Chinese tea ceremony. Switching gears a little bit. What is a lineage and how does a lineage form? So lineage are a series of, of teachers where someone teaches someone and they teach someone else. And 
it forms a branching structure and usually goes back um, to some to some central point or some point of origin. So the uh, most classic example in T is probably Senyuriku, who you can kind of place as the origin point um, for all the major schools of Japanese tea ceremony from which various lineages broke off. Moto Senke, Uda Senke, and Wushu Koji Senke. Um, and those are all lineage-based systems where the Iomoto um, is the, the head of the, the lineage and it gets handed off down the uh, paternal generational line. Right. I, I think, uh, you know, you definitely already explained that. I'm not going to talk too much more about specifically what a lineage is, but I, I when I think of lineage, um, I think it's one of the most powerful tools that we as humans have, right? We use our lifespan to accumulate all of this knowledge, and then we pass that knowledge down to someone else who has, uh, assumedly, a longer lifespan ahead of them than we have. And they take all of that knowledge over the course of a couple of years and they run with it. And over the course of uh, generations, right, um, you get to the point where, you know, uh, someone like you or me, right, we can learn how to brew tea really well within talking specifically within the Chinese tea process. Uh, we can learn how to brew tea really well, hold a teapot, hold a gaiwan, hold a tea bowl, et cetera, very quickly within a year, right, or, or less. And it's because so many of the very specific motions, so much of this inherited knowledge is all passed down through this really powerful tool uh, that is the lineage. Um, so I think, you know, uh, thinking about it more abstractly, right, I think it's it's how we've, as a human society, have gotten to where we are because uh, you can learn about calculus before you're, you know, 20 years old. Things that took, you know, decades or hundreds of years for human society to develop uh, can be learned very quickly just on YouTube at this point. Uh, but I think really with a teacher, right, the power of a, a lineage comes forward. How they're formed was another part of your question. And that's that's a more interesting point, you know, because we each of us actually has taught some students. Uh, we have a lineage. I think, you know, Ryan and I feed back up into your lineage, Jason. The way that they start, I would think, is that someone is understood to be a teacher. They start teaching. People want to learn what they're teaching, and eventually the people who learn from the teacher start teaching other people. And from there, I think you you have this knowledge that flows out. I can't think of really any other way that a lineage would start. That was going to be my next question is, what what is your experience with lineages and tea? Uh, I guess I can go and then, because Ryan, uh, you know, we just feed right into each other. But yeah, I mean, I I had studied under uh, you, Jason, uh, for, you know, approximately uh, a year before uh, we had all started receiving schooling from some other teachers. So, you know, I learned how to brew with a guy one from you. I learned how to brew with a teapot from you, you know, learned just a ton about tea uh, from you. And then from there, you know, started learning from other teachers, incorporating kind of my own thoughts about tea, my own philosophy. Um, and then I also had the opportunity, right, to teach students as well. Um, and so I went on to teach students for about two or three years. Um, and so all of those students who I taught, I don't know if that includes you, Ryan. I don't remember if I, I don't think I taught you. Uh, but all the t students I taught, right, um, while some of my philosophy, et cetera, is, is in my teaching, uh, I think a lot of it still feeds back up into, um, you know, both your lineage, Jason, as well as, you know, some of the other uh, teachers we had studied under. Ryan? Yeah. So to take the, to complete the history of the people on the podcast, Pat taught uh, two students, Merv, Clark, and Spiro, um, who had it, and at the T Institute, we actually called them lineages. Um, so there was the lecture series, which took place once once a week, uh, all semester, and that was with everyone together. And then separately, you had your own groups, which we called lineages, um, which were usually led by two people and about groups of uh, five to six students. So I studied under um, two people that, uh, that Pat taught, uh, were great teachers. And then once everyone graduated into the institute, um, then we had back to group lessons. Or Pat, it was either you or sometimes it was Jason um, doing the more advanced lessons. And did anyone ordain me as a teacher? How was it that we just that that it became a lineage? Did we, we you know we said that we even called it lineages, but did we declare a lineage? Did we sign up with the the Imperial Lineage Agency? Did we? Yeah, I um I I gutted a goat, poured its blood around you. <laughs> Uh, we lit it on fire and we, you know, sent signals to the gods that uh, you were now the ordained head of uh, your own tea ceremony lineage. 
Uh, no, you, you know, you had studied with other teachers, right, Jason, and um, you had, you know, picked up some knowledge. Uh, and there was just a group of people who were looking for that knowledge, you know, had something to learn from you. There's, there's nothing stopping us, right? Uh, you don't, you don't need to be ordained the head of your own lineage. You just start teaching. And as you learn more, um, you're able to teach us more. And as we learn, hopefully we're able to teach you something back. And it, it just, you know, moves from there. I think it's a very powerful force. As I had talked about before, I think, you know, really one of the most amazing tools uh, human culture has ever developed. As much as I hate giving Jason credit, Jason really did do it the hard way. You know, have, having to pull from multiple sources and you know decide what your own teaching style would be is is pretty effective. I mean, it those lineages ran for a very, very, very long time, um, and the average skill of the practitioner base within the T Institute just got better and better and better, and a lot of institutional knowledge uh, got encoded both in writing and with in person transmission, which is hard to do because it's such a you, you know Chinese tea ceremony is an experience. It's phenomenological in nature, right? So it's about it not you can't write everything down. Um, it's a how, you know how do you teach that and and do those knowledge transfers uh, when it's you know all being perceived through the senses. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, one of your other points I really want to highlight is yeah we we don't want it to be the praise Jason podcast, uh, but you you did do a really good job. Um, you know I mean we're we're still here with you about a decade later, right? Uh, wanting to talk tea with you so and still still continuing to move forward on our own journey in the tea world i just seem to have taken like a hard right turn to the uh being shipwreck <laughs> yeah no one no one else has really picked up on that but we're all happy that you did <laughs> you know if you really want to get hardcore into like uh you know masterpiece era puer cakes or like you know anything else you just let us know we'll be happy to come drink tea with you until until i can sort the decades of the the hong yin by year um like I'm, i don't believe that i that i know anything at all <laughs> yeah everyone's gonna you know a lot of people at home are gonna be happy to hear you say that we'll just have you repeat it i don't believe i know anything at all <laughs> quoting socrates of course um uh, yeah we all got that the why the wise man knows that he knows nothing at all my my last question or maybe my penultimate question. We'll see how long this question takes. Are we part of Lu Yu's lineage? So I, I think this is always an interesting one. I, there is quite a bit of, I think, debate within the, the tea community, maybe not specifically around that question, but the spirit of that question uh, to move forward with the spirit, right? Uh, I believe that we are practicing within the framework of the goal that Lu Yu set out. So n none of us studied under anyone who studied directly under anyone who studied with anyone who studied with Luyu, right? There is no uh, direct connection such that, you know, uh, the Senke, right, tea schools have where, you know, if you studied in Omote, Ura, Mushikoji, um, you are studying with someone who has studied with someone that eventually ties back to Senorikyu. That, of course, does not exist in Chinese tea ceremony. However, uh, through the charging, and I think the codification, right, of what a tea practice is within Chinese context, I think Lu Yu really set out what the spirit of tea ceremony is. And I believe that if, you know, you are practicing within uh, that spirit, uh, that in some way, shape or form, your practice harkens back to his. And so it very loosely can be interpreted uh, interpreted as, as a lineage, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything uh, that you said, Pat. I think thinking about it in terms of frameworks, especially with Chinese tea where it's less rigid is the way to do it. Um, because even like, let's take Jason as a beginner, right? Or any beginner who's just starting out today, right? They're going to be pooling knowledge from multiple sources um, and then compiling that into their own practice and living and breathing that every day. Um, so lineages in general outside of institutions um, are much more organic and less rigid and more framework based than with within an institution. If it was institutionalized, I don't think we could call this a lineage. I think it's just an artifact of the fact that um, Chinese tea ceremony is very bottoms up. What what is the effect when lineages are uh, embodied not by all of the students but by singular individuals who get handed down? Uh, the Dharma or the charter to teach. And so, you know, Pat, you and I studied under one uh, tea master like that, uh, Hyo Am, the inheritor of the Dharma of Choi. Um, 
and it's a it's always a powerful experience to be around him both when he's when he's on and doing tea and when he's not on and acting almost like a normal person as normal as someone who inherited the dharma of cho oi can act and um you know it's a it's a world of difference being with him and and having him performing um korean tea ceremony darya and the various buddhist forms of korean tea ceremony uh and then later that night going out and uh drinking beer and eating chimak and hearing him you know pinch my cheek and pinch everyone else's cheeks and hold the beer glass above his head after he chugs it yeah, yeah. and it's um you know it's a, it's actually it's a the the experience of course of being around someone who you can call who you can reasonably really call a master right um is is always a powerful experience but what does it mean for for him to be the inheritor what does it mean for the future of those types of lineages as far as i know he doesn't have a student that he's handed the dharma to yeah i, I think that's a really interesting thought because um those are you know the lineages in which the reality of them uh, facing out of existence is is imminent or really possible, right? Um, whereas the the loose form of the lineage that we've inherited, right, that we have, not to use the word inherited, um, really is very unlikely to, to die out in any way, shape, or form, right? Maybe our specific individual philosophies, right, uh, may not still be imbued within them in a decade, two decades, or so on and so forth, but uh, yeah, those those inherited lineages uh, just operate so differently because they can only be passed on by one person. Because that person has to accept students, because there has to be someone who wants to study with that person, um, it really limits the field uh, with which that uh, practice can move through other people, can take on new ideas, and can really progress. Uh, and you know, that's kind of why I think uh, Chinese tea ceremony, as we've talked about before. Uh, it's never going to really work in that way where you can only learn from one master and that master will teach students, but those students can't all teach other students. Uh, only one of them maybe can once they inherit the title, right? Because um, the progression of the techniques, teas, ideas is is so much more important in Chinese tea ceremony and is less rigid, obviously. Um, so I think it's just a very, very interesting point to think upon. Uh, I also really do miss being with, uh, you know, Mr. Hong. Uh, Master Xiao um, right? And just not not even just having tea with him, just being around him is definitely an experience and a lot of fun. So uh, really looking forward to the next time I can have tea with him. Well, everyone, that is all the time that we have today. Thank you all for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for a discussion of the next chapter, Knowledge Transmission and the Transmission of Knowledge.